Hello and welcome to Spiritual Biology. This is our fifth and final session about vitality. The topic is going to be universal vitality. Now we reside in a universe and we grew out of our universe and everything around us did also. So in a certain sense, all of the vitality that we and everything else experiences is universal. But in this talk, I want to go a little deeper and look at where the vitality of the universe comes from and then link that up with our individual personal vitality. We're looking here at a model of the so-called cosmic web. This is the arrangement of galaxies in space. So this is a relatively small proportion of the universe, although it's a very vast area. The finest filaments that you see are little lines of more or less individual galaxies. The larger clumps are hundreds or thousands or possibly millions of galaxies in very large clusters. So we can see here that there are regions that are highly contained in the sense that they contain a lot of galaxies and regions that are quite open in the sense that there's not a lot there. And these two complementary pairs of containment and openness have been the topic of several previous sessions in this series, and we'll continue to work with them. They're actually important in physics in a certain sense that I believe most people are familiar with. So if we begin with a very contained structure like a sugar cube, so a sugar cube consists of compacted sugar crystals formed into a cube and the crystals themselves consist of very densely arranged sugar molecules. So this is a highly contained organization. If we drop it into a teacup, we know that it will rapidly dissolve. And this is an automatic process. It can be sped up by stirring, but it will happen spontaneously because this is an example of the automatic and inevitable increase of so-called entropy in the universe. So entropy is the tendency of everything to move from whatever state of organization it's in to a state of greater disorganization. We use the term colloquially. For instance, if we tidy up a desktop and over time it becomes cluttered and chaotic, we can say that entropy has increased. This doesn't have the same precise physical meaning as in the case of the sugar cube, but it's really the same concept. Maintaining organization takes work, and in the absence of that work, everything tends to disorder. We can use the word in yet another sense, referring to arrangements of people. On the left here, we see cadets lined up in a regular formation. They're all in roughly the same posture. They're spaced evenly. It's quite contained. On the right, we see a more chaotic arrangement of people. Their postures are all different, and they don't seem to be placed in any particular pattern. So there's high degree of containment on the left and a high degree of openness on the right, and this has at least some parallel to this idea of entropy. It also brings up the point that increasing entropy isn't necessarily a bad thing. In this particular case, there's a sort of aesthetic judgment. Some people prefer the precision and regularity of a military formation to the chaos of a dance party. Others like the color and creativity of the dancers and aren't so excited about the military arrangement. But those are aesthetic judgments. There isn't an overriding value that can be applied to one as opposed to the other. The preferences that we have for different arrangements may relate, possibly, and this is speculative, to how much time we spend relatively grounded in one or another of our two brain hemispheres. It's popular knowledge that the left hemisphere is more verbal, it's more oriented to time, and it's analytical, whereas the right hemisphere tends to be more musical, it's spatially tuned, and it's intuitive. 
So possibly these two different hemispheric alignments explain some of our preferences. But more importantly, we bring in here another complementary pair, that of the left and right hemisphere with their different functions. And these are in a dynamic conversation with one another, a flowing creativity that fuels some of our vitality. Well, we can talk about entropy at a much larger scale, that of the entire universe. So we know that the universe began in something we call the Big Bang. At that time, everything that we see, all the matter, all the energy, was compressed in or hadn't yet expanded out of a state of unimaginable density and containment. The whole universe at that time, according to the theory, was smaller than an atom. Very rapidly, once it started expanding, it underwent a enormous and mind-boggling enlargement very early on. And then from that time forth, it has continued to expand, although at a slower rate. So here we are after a lot of expansion. So the universe has already moved from a state of extreme containment to a much more open configuration. But the projection is that there will continue to be increasing openness until the universe eventually reaches a state where the galaxies are immensely far apart to the point where light can no longer travel between them and most of the stars will have burnt out. So that will be maximal openness and it's sometimes referred to as the big freeze. If we look at this intermediate zone where we are now, we see the interesting stuff that makes life fascinating for us, such as our galaxy. This is an artist's conception of what the Milky, of what the Milky Way galaxy might look like if we could get outside of it. I think you'll agree that this time period that we're in now is more interesting than either the Big Bang or the Big Freeze. If you look at the galaxy, you see the obvious spiral arrangement of it, which might be reminiscent of the spiral arrangement of, wa of water as it flows out of a container like a bathtub into some open waterway like a bay. So as the water moves from containment to openness, it adopts the spiral configuration because that facilitates the flow. It makes it go faster and more efficiently. In a similar sense, the galaxy and all other structures are felt to facilitate the movement of the universe from this state of containment to the state of openness. In other words, it facilitates the increase of entropy. Now this is technical and I can't claim to understand it very well myself, but this is what the physicists say, that these structures that we see around us, like galaxies and whirlpools, are so-called dissipative structures. They dissipate the containment into a state of greater openness and facilitate the increase in entropy. Well, by the same reasoning, we as humans are also dissipative structures, which means that we are actually created by entropy. We often think of entropy as the thing that causes us to age and causes everything to fall apart, but it's also the force that generates us in the first place. So this once again emphasizes the point that entropy isn't simply some terrible thing that causes stuff to fall apart. It's also creative. We can look again at the Big Bang to get a little more insight. So here we are at the earliest moment and very rapidly after the Big Bang, we've got all sorts of stuff in the universe spread out all over the place. And the list of different things that's out there is long. I wanna focus on just a few chemical elements and chemical compounds, such as carbon dioxide, water, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and so on. So carbon dioxide, we know, is distributed in the atmosphere, so it's very diffuse up there. It's not at a very high concentration. I mean, it has a significant effect, but it's only a tiny fraction of the amount of gas in the atmosphere. There's water up there too, but of course most of the water is in the waterways and particularly the oceans. Nitrogen is partly in the atmosphere, but it's also in the soil, and phosphorus and potassium are widely distributed in rocks and soil. So why is this important? Well, we've got all these widely dispersed molecules. And then we bring them into contact with a life form, specifically a plant. So here we're looking at little pine seedlings growing. 
And they begin by using the nutrients in the seed to get started. But as they get larger and larger, they start to pull in the material around them, specifically the water and the carbon dioxide and the nitrogen and so on. And they draw that stuff in and they use it to build their bodies. They use it to build up the structure that we know as a pine tree or even an entire forest. So if you think about it, what's happened here is this very widely dispersed and chaotic arrangement of different atoms and compounds has been drawn together and organized into a tree or a forest. So the impression we have is that entropy has decreased. Now this violates what's called the second law of thermodynamics that I referred to earlier without naming it. According to that law, entropy must always increase. So it's reasonable to ask what's going on here, and of course there's an explanation. And we can understand it by taking a bigger perspective. From a larger framework, we notice that there isn't just the earth and a forest, there's also this thing we call a star, our sun, which in essence is an enormous thermonuclear reactor. So this thermonuclear reactor is spewing out enormous amounts of radiation into the cosmos. It's converting very compact little hydrogen atoms into energy that then blasts forth and spreads widely. The effect of that is to vastly increase entropy. Okay, so the sun is a generator of high entropy, and that high entropy from the sun is what drives the local decrease of entropy in life forms on Earth. So this is allowed because the net effect is still entropy increasing, even if it decreases locally. And this actually is the whole principle behind dissipative structures. They form a little bit of localized increase in structure and decrease in entropy in order to participate in, and in many cases facilitate, the global, that is to say the universal, rise in entropy. Well, if we go back to our language of containment and openness, we can see that in this instance, things are moving from the side of being open to the side of being contained, the opposite of the overall movement in the universe. But it emphasizes the point that the two are in a conversation, a dynamic and creative interplay. This is the principle of complementary pairs working together in a flowing fashion and generating vitality. Going back to the universe, now with our solar system situated in it, we can remember that out of the universe, and as a consequence of this same entropy function, we have the evolution of life on Earth and the evolution of our species. So this is growing directly out of the same movement that is taking the universe from the state of extreme containment of the Big Bang to the state of extreme openness at the eventual Big Freeze. And of course, by extension, our own individual lives that began with conception, moved through fetal development, full-term pregnancy, infancy, and then you know, childhood, middle age, and old age, all of that is part of the same flow. And so our vitality is directly due to this flowing function of the universe from containment to openness. I want to focus a little bit on this final stage in the life cycle when the body becomes increasingly elderly and frail and eventually loses its grip on life and we die. As individuals, we tend to be a little offended by that, but there is a perspective that can help. We touched on it in the mortality series, but I want to reiterate the point a bit. So we can look at all of this in another, uh, with a different perspective, looking at the universe as a whole and thinking about things in a larger framework. So we normally think of pregnancy and childbirth as setting the stage for an entire life cycle that then ends and is terminated by death and old age. But we could equally well say that when people die and return to the earth, that they're providing nutrients to the planet to fuel new life, and they're opening up space for the entry of new humans, new infants. You know, if we just if everyone got born and never died, at some point there just wouldn't be any more room and there certainly wouldn't be resources left for us all to survive. So we, someone has to die to make room for the little babies coming into the earth. 
this cycling from young to old to young again is part of the yin-yang cycle that we discussed earlier. So the yin is the descending and the yang is the ascending phase of life. And these are continually alternating, flowing into one another. So the old age and the early life are another complementary pair that we can place alongside all the other complementary pairs. Earlier in this talk, we mentioned the two brain hemispheres. In the prior talk, we looked at the relative containment of our heart that we use to protect ourselves and the relative openness that we use to connect with others. In the sexuality talk, we looked at the complementary pair of masculine and feminine. And we also looked at the complementarity of high activity and restfulness. All of these are in dynamic interplay that generates creativity and generates vitality. So as individuals, we're just rooted in all this, in the cosmic web and all these complementary pairs and the flow between them, and we draw vitality from all of it as it flows. As we come to the end of this talk and the end of this series, I'd like to spend a few moments talking about different styles of meditation. One of the common practices that we've been exploring is to focus our attention on a particular region of the body. For instance, the area of the chest wall in the region of the heart, focusing on it and noting how it moves as we breathe. Okay, we attend to the breathing process as we detect it in that relatively confined region of the body. So when we're doing that, we're containing our attention. So we're bringing in this word again of containment. We have our attention focused in a highly contained region. The technical term for this in meditation circles is concentration. This counts as a concentration practice because we're concentrating on a specific region. Or another way to say that is we're concentrating our attention into a specific region. So that's one way to meditate. Now there's another, and of course there are several, but th this is, we're going to just look at two. Another way to meditate is to allow the focus to expand to a much broader field. So in this case, we don't direct attention, we just rest in an open state. So this is more openness. We rest in an open state of awareness, and we just notice what moves through consciousness. So we might notice some thoughts, we might notice some bodily sensations, we might notice some interplay between the body and the thoughts that we call emotions, we might be attuned to stuff going on in the environment, sounds or vibrations and so on. But whatever comes up, we attend to it neutrally, watching it non-judgmentally without grabbing hold of any of it or being dragged along. So if a thought arises, we don't dwell on it and move from thought to thought to thought. We simply watch it pass. Of course, sometimes we get distracted, we get lost in a thought, but when we notice that that has happened, we simply return to the open practice, which is technically referred to as open awareness. In the guided meditation that accompanies this slide set, we will work with these two modes of meditation, the concentration and open awareness practices, and we'll move back and forth between them.